Uh, hi, it gives me a lot of uh, pleasure uh, to bring to you uh, one of its kind discussion uh, on the hot topic that we have uh, in front of us. One year of the disturbance, war, conflict, different words they have been using around it in Middle East region. Because I'm not going to see this only an issue of uh, that is confined to one country that is Israel. And I have requested uh, Ambassador Mahesh Sajdev, sir, who is the expert on the issue, who knows things going on there. He is himself been there. He is a retired IFS officer who has served firsthand in this region, whose great knowledge of Arab that always impresses me with his Arabic knowledge and the Arab world, the culture, the energy, the issues which is uh, affecting the whole world today. I have got some questions uh, specifically uh, for him that will help students who are preparing for civil service examination in India that they would have the most authentic view, the India's position as direct as from a retired ambassador Sachdev. Sir has agreed to uh, take up some of the questions, which is mostly not directly reported in the newspaper as uh, facts, but in a deeper analysis, they become very vital. I think, uh, uh, thank you for uh, giving me your time, sir. Uh, the first thing which I would like you to ask for on behalf of our students uh, that they should be concerned about and they should be looking forward to is that one year, it has been one year and uh, few days already in this entire conflict i suppose how do you think that entire geopolitical landscape of this region has evolved i would like to hear out your view as to how a student should see this uh, thing happening evolving in uh, this region thank you dr khan it's an honor to be uh, on this program uh, and uh, i think uh, you have been uh, more than kind in uh, uh, praising me, but uh, and my knowledge of the area. Uh, at the same time, more you know, less you understand. So it's uh, it's uh, easy to uh, get confused, and uh, it's uh, even easier to confuse others, uh, particularly when you're dealing with such an such a complexity and such an evolving situation as the current Middle East crisis. Uh, to recapitulate, uh, it, it has been a year full of surprises, which began on October 7, when amongst the biggest upset uh, for a long, long time, Israeli defenses on Gaza border were overwhelmed and uh, Hamas and Palestine Jihad, Islamic Jihad, were able to take an element of surprise to Israel uh, for once and attack uh, the neighboring kibbutzim or the villages uh, and in particularly a music concert that was ongoing uh, in the early morning of October 7. What followed uh, the big carnage, 1,200 Israelis and others uh, in that area were uh, killed, and uh, over 250 were taken hostages to Gaza. Israeli, this was Israel's worst moment, worst uh, debacle in an, uh, since its independence in 1948. And the country reacted with abomination, horror, and determination to avenge these deaths and hostages being taken. Uh, since then, Israel has been unrelenting, very determined in pursuing its pre-war aims, to which a fourth one was recently added. Firstly, getting back their hostages. Secondly, 
removing Hamas as an antagonist to Israel. Thirdly, making sure that Gaza is never used as a springboard for similar attacks. To that, a fourth objective has been added last month, which is against Hezbollah in the north, uh, on across Lebanese border, that the Israeli settler, Israeli living in that area, uh, within Israel's northern border zone, would need to be able to return and lead normal life uh, without being scared of attacks by Hezbollah. Currently, around 60,000 such people are displaced internally in Israel, uh, which are causing a huge burden on the society and the finances. Be it as it may, one year on, Israel is not able to say that it has achieved all these three or four objectives. Uh, it continues to be a shifting target. Hamas has not been obliterated. Gaza has not been secured. Hostages, at least nearly 100 of them, remain in the custody of Hamas. And northern Israel continues to be in uh, facing rockets and drone attacks from Hezbollah. Uh, so that has uh, been, uh, in, in summation, the, uh, the outcome of this one year. Uh, why has it happened that way is another question. And uh, what future for boards uh, in this regard is something that, that we can ponder over. But sir, I think uh, uh, if we looked at it uh, in a traditional way, this was a very localized issue in uh, certain areas of uh, uh, Gaza and, and uh, Israel. It was there. But now it, it doesn't uh, uh, seem to be an issue which is local. I mean, you have uh, direct involvement, so to say, of Iran, which is very evident. Lebanon is, is uh, of course, uh, they already there on the ground. Israel is there on the ground. So. U.S. is uh, uh, definitely having a, a big stake and a lot of European countries are uh, not shying away in uh, talking about this in open terms. So this, in fact, has become a major issue which directly involves so many more countries. How do you see this evolution and then where do you see this whole thing is moving on to? I think the kernel of the conflict historically has been Israel-Palestine issue, which remains unresolved for a long, long time, uh, let's say 100 years, going back to 1917 when Balfour Declaration was signed, under which British uh, colonial power uh, agreed to establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine in return for Jew, world Jewry's support against Germany in the First World War. Uh, that provided the bedrock of legality as the Zionist movement saw it to uh, legitimize uh, the quest for a Jewish state in uh, Palestine. Uh, and since then, uh, we move on to uh, Holocaust of 6 million Jews during the Second World War by Nazi Germany, and mass migration of Jews from Europe and elsewhere in occupied Palestine uh, under British mandate, uh, leading to uh, hostilities between the local Arab population supported by outside Arabs and Muslims, and uh, Israeli increasingly assertive in, uh, with the money power from uh, certain rich American Jews, uh, buying land and creating de facto uh, state. Uh, 
under these uh, circumstances, one of the first United Nations General Assembly actions was to pass a resolution dividing Palestine into uh, Israel and Palestine, with Jerusalem, the Holy City, and the people uh, governments. This was uh, not accepted by Arabs. Israelis accepted. They would give them a state for the first time in 2000 years. And it uh, uh, and another war started. And from there on, 256, 267, 373, we've had Arab-Israeli conflicts. Uh, and we have had uh, relative stability since Camp David agreements of uh, 1979 between Egypt and uh, Israel, uh, sponsored by the American administration. Uh, the two sides, the biggest, that, that way, the biggest uh, Arab country, Egypt, was uh, able to buy peace with Israel, and Israeli hand became stronger, geopolitically speaking. Uh, since then, uh, there were some developments about uh, uh, about trying to resolve the Arab-Israel conflict through a solution to Palestine problem, and an Oslo Accord was signed in early 1990s, which provided for a two-state solution. Remember, this was the two-state solution that was the United Nations General Assembly had passed in 1948. Uh, Israel and Palestine Authority accepted it, but the movement has been uh, slow. And uh, recently, Israel has reneged on two-state solution. Uh, it has said that this solution would reward Hamas for what it has done, and therefore it is not. He, he, the, the Israeli Knesset had unanimous, almost unanimously passed the resolution, uh, saying that Israel doesn't stand bound by Oslo Accord. Uh, that is the context against which what you said, internationalization of the local conflict has taken place. Uh, there is There are two or three themes that disturb international community. First is involvement of non-state actors. By definition, Hamas, Hezbollah, and Houthi are non-state actors. They do not have a a, a, a legitimacy uh, in regard of the international law to act like state actors. They cannot be punished because they are, there is no capital, there is no government, and uh, they, they are free to act in whatever way they want to act. They do not uh, abide by either humanitarian law or laws of the war, uh, and therefore, Israel also does not observe that kind of uh, uh, reciprocal behavior. Uh, no state actor could have done on 7th of October what Hamas was able to do. Uh, it would have been uh, thrown out of the international community, ostracized, sanctioned, etc., etc. But non-state actors do not bear that kind of... Uh, uh, reciprocity. Uh, that is part one. Second part is that uh, while they need really to see this uh, in in the religious context, they are subtext to the same. Hamas is uh, uh, traditionally uh, a close ally with the Muslim Brotherhood which at one time had ruled Egypt for a short while, 10 years ago. Uh, that is political Islam of Sunni type against which 
Gulf Arabs particularly, and most of the mainstream Sunni Arabs uh, abominate. They don't like either Muslim Brotherhood or Hamas by implication. So there was, uh, while there was a lot of truth putting, a lot of uh, uh, anger, frustration expressed against Israel uh, for uh, doing what it did to Hamas. 42,000 people killed, 80 persons with the buildings in um, Gaza destroyed, people displaced, and uh, huge depravity uh, was limited upon, was criticized uh, both regionally and internationally. But Hamas did not find much of his support from the Sunni Arab states. Iran was a country that was uh, that prides itself in being a minority of one. It's a Shia state. It is a revolutionary state, and therefore it uh, uh, it had uh, its own uh, proclivities favorable to Israel, favorable to Hamas. Actually. And against Israel, and therefore it supported Hamas, rendered all sort of uh, uh, political assistance, uh, and uh, Israel often accused Iran of supporting Hamas materially as well. Uh, so that is where the the, the plot gets thickened and widened. Then there are. Uh, other non-state actors allied with Iran, Houthis and Hezbollah, Houthis of North Yemen and Hezbollah of uh, basically southern part of uh, Lebanon. Hezbollah is a Shia body, and uh, that way it is uh, uh, it is kindred of uh, Iran, which is also Shia, as I already informed. Uh, so there is a great deal of empathy uh, between the two over the past 40 years, since 82, when Iran uh, contrived to have Hezbollah created in Lebanon. Uh, it has, Iran, Iran has supported Hezbollah uh, through various means. Similarly, Houthis are a Shia aligned Zaydi sect in northern Yemen, uh, which is rebelling against the uh, central government widely recognized internationally. It has had uh, some successes in the north, and uh, it has uh, also had an alliance with uh, Iran. Uh, Iranians uh, are believed to have supplied uh, it with uh, various arsenals, including missiles and uh, ways that leads to attack maritime shipping that it has been working in the Red Sea uh, choke point area. Bab al Mandeb has been uh, uh, an area of activity by uh, Houthi rebels, which has uh, greatly affected the maritime uh, trade, and uh, nearly a third of uh, world uh, of maritime trade to Suez Canal has been affected, and uh, uh, this has forced navigation between Asia and Europe and uh, Northern America through. Cape of Good Hope in uh, uh, in uh, southern Africa, and uh, it has extended the, the costs of navigation. World trade has become a subject. So all these three uh, state actors plus Iran have uh, uh, widened the conflict, uh, and uh, Israel has uh, been. Uh, 
acting in uh, to defend itself and it says but it has gone on offensive very often and has uh, uh, has currently been fighting a similar battle in southern Lebanon including southern Beirut against Hezbollah the kind of which it had fought in Gaza Strip. Uh, the four things don't look too good. And uh, uh, regionalization or internationalization of this conflict is uh, a, a threat which is quite real, particularly in case Israel's threatened response to October 1 missile attacks by Iran takes place in a substantive way, and Iran has already threatened to retaliate, including hitting U.S. assets in the region or oil uh, assets of the Gulf countries or closing Strait of Hormuz, through which nearly 20% of global oil supplies go. If that happens, we are in for even worse case scenario than what we already have.